Hey everybody, we get to talk about one of my favorite topics today. It's the second upload on alpha factors, also known as external emotions. I'm going to try not to make this too long, but there is a ton I have thought about it and a ton I can say about it. And it's fun as heck to think about because it is outside of our normal range of thinking. It explains all kinds of things about art and movies and books. It allows you to do lots of counterintuitive stuff and it clears up tons of things. We're going to expand a bit on the stuff in the video. We're going to talk a bit about where the idea came from. And perhaps most interestingly, we're going to apply it to more examples to show how much it can explain and how people can use it if you make art or write or even produce and direct or make movies or music. So this should be awesome. Okay, the video introduces the general idea. There's a lot of text and material there. Of course, I don't think you really have to read any of it if you just follow the voiceover. Anyway, a lot of people can recognize, especially once it's pointed out, that their feelings about things can be influenced by outside things, like how they feel about movies and music and paintings. But this isn't any vague suggestion. What we're talking about here is something much clearer and more specific, and it has definite properties which make it matter. I've gone through and figured out as much as I can. Like I said, I really like this concept and I've been working through it in my head for a long time before I actually put this video out. I switched through various titles, experimented with it, experimented with it, etc., etc. Anyway, this is an important thing and it's a definite thing and has definite properties in terms of how it works. Okay, first of all, these external emotional factors are not optional. This isn't Oh, you might be in a better mood if you just got a raise, or you might be angry at someone and it would make you rate the movie lower. No. These things literally mix with and corrupt your emotional compass. They are going to affect your opinion of what you watch. Whether we realize it or not, whether the artist intends it or not, and whether we like it or not. Your only options, when you are aware of some outside emotional element, something that's gone into that alpha processing, the brain's normal state of mind outside of the world of the movie or whatever you're looking into. Your only options are to have that thing corrupt your compass while watching the movie or to just guess how you would have felt otherwise. You cannot, if you know about the alpha story, the events outside the painting or movie, you cannot just choose not to be affected by it. It's not how our emotions work. The best example I can use to give the idea is movie spoilers. Generally, well, everybody hates movie spoilers. There was a study done recently that tried to claim that it wasn't the case, by the way. The study was wrong. But that's beside the point. Movie spoilers are hated because they corrupt your experience of watching the movie, right? You cannot just forget that you heard what the ending of the movie is. We can only watch the movie with less anticipation and interest and enjoyment. Or, just try to guess if we would have liked the movie otherwise. Our emotions are only generated in real time based on events. If they're corrupted by something, they're corrupted. Well, the alpha story, the story outside the movie, is the exact same way. As long as the audience knows it, it is in their head. This is why I used the picture of the tides when I talked about how we can learn to use it. Imagine running a boat race across the ocean without knowing about the tides. You know, it's, it's a really good analogy to me. The tides are going to move your boat, whether you know it or not, whether you like it or not. And if the boat racers didn't know it, you'd see them thrown about in an unpredictable fashion. Some racers would get nowhere, and others who weren't nearly as good would end up way ahead because they happened to catch the current. Well, think of this the same way. It's there, and it's manipulating all artistic products, whether we know it or not. And generally, we haven't known it. So, you can't just hear this and forget about it. You'll go back to that state of confusion that we've been in. It's necessary. So, to me, that's why this is really important. Now, the reason that this is the case is, generally, that the brain isn't adapted for fiction. We don't have any alternate form of processing which takes things in without taking them seriously. No, the brain just judges situations based on everything it knows. This means that the brain's knowledge of the outside world goes right on into what you're thinking when you are looking at a painting or hearing music or watching a movie. We'll focus on the movie part for now. We'll say movie, but it applies across the board. You see, intellectually, you can probably separate fiction from reality because the intellect can adjust in the short term for those different things. 
But movies, like any other art, don't work on the intellect. See, that's part of what we need to be aware of. You really need to take that in to see how this works. The movie is judged by our emotional reaction, which comes from how your instinct and other non-intellectual parts of your brain react to what you see. And you see, when a movie works well, it's because it's believable enough that it triggered your instinct to react to it. The instinct doesn't choose to react to things. It either is simply triggered or not, based on how believable something is. And its reaction is always as though the thing is real. Thus, when your instinct is triggered by a movie, it switches on in normal processing mode, just as if it was looking at anything else that was part of your actual existence. I mean, the movie has people you don't know personally in places you've never visited, but as long as your suspension of disbelief is triggered, your instinct just reacts as though it was watching some new people. If there is anything else about those actors or that place and so on, anything associated with it from the real world, your instinct just takes that into account and throws it into your feelings. After all, if you don't like someone in the real world, you will have the same reaction if you saw them at a baseball game, because your brain is telling you that that is someone not to trust based on what you know for other reasons. Well, it's the same thing if you see them as an actor in a movie. Your brain still knows the face. Similarly, if the movie does not trigger your suspension of disbelief, or some other elements don't trigger it, then you will still be prone to this because you'll treat it like a construct, like looking at a Lego castle that your friend made. If you know stuff about your friend's experience building that Lego castle, it will factor into what you feel when you look at it, like how you have emotional attachments to your wedding ring, for example. So that's the kind of thing that we listed with the clerk's example. Even though you don't know the actors or place, and the black and white probably made it harder to suspend your disbelief, the part of our instinct that recognizes it as something made attaches what it knows about that to the movie. In this case, that Kevin Smith maxed out his credit cards, overcame the odds, and so on to make the movie. So, even though the part of you that believes some aspect of the movie is taking into account that internal part, other parts of your brain were also attaching the same deep feeling you get from an underdog story to the viewing of the movie, because you know what Kevin Smith went through to make it. And of course Kevin Smith found himself unable to recreate that success, we touched on that in the video. And the same thing actually happened with Rocky. For example, Rocky was taken very seriously when it came out, because it was a good movie, but also because of the Alpha story with Stallone giving it that huge extra punch and making it into an Oscar-worthy experience. Keep in mind, though, that these things also are happening subconsciously. They're based on instinctive reactions, which we also mentioned in the video very quickly. This idea lets us totally do away with that hypothesis that we've been struggling with, which is that people are somehow not smart enough to appreciate great art, which, of course, leads us to dead ends. We talked about it, but art works on the instinct rather than the intellect anyway, but it also helps us to not run into that problem where we say, well, people like terrible art, that's why that guy succeeded, because that stops us from explaining all the other people making terrible art who didn't succeed. You know, David Hasselhoff is not the only bad singer in the world. If you think people just had bad taste or liked his songs in Germany because he was terrible, then you can't explain why they liked him and not a hundred other people, and why there isn't any new Hasselhoff that they love after him. But the alpha story around his music, the fall of the Berlin Wall, where it represented that moment in their history to them, makes it clear that there was great emotional power attached to that song for them, which those of us outside Germany don't feel. Our processing of the song takes in different factors from theirs, and thus turns in a totally different result. But it makes sense, and at no point do we have to just become bitter or angry at anyone else for not being smart enough to like what we think is good things become more logical this way. And on top of that, people as a whole are actually of normal intelligence, by definition of course, so that's another reason why that idea is funny but not really accurate. So anyway, we've got all these things that fall into place now, these various events where talent doesn't line up with results, and I'm really glad because on the channel I've been doing some uploads where I was talking about specific movies, but I kind of had to dance around this in the process, at least until now, when we could talk about it more thoroughly because it needs its own topic. But I did bring it up once or twice before when I mentioned that liking that a movie was made for Fifty Shades of Grey's audience would make people enjoy watching 
the movie more. And when we were talking about the Ninja Turtles, when I said that remaking the movie went against people's desire for confirmation of the way they view the world. At that point, I used a totally different term. I think I called it exo-confirmation, whereas now I'd call it alpha-confirmation. But I do that, you know. Naming things is fun. It makes them easier to talk about and remember. And with an idea like this, I really tried to think of something that made sense and was easy to say, and wasn't already used for something else. Meta, exo, outer, omni, I tried a ton of prefixes. But anyway, I eventually settled on alpha because it's easy to say and write. As far as I can see, it wasn't used for anything well known in writing or movie theory, and you can use it in a lot of ways. Alpha story, alpha factors, alpha content, blah blah blah. And also, more so than that, you can use it to refer separately to the events outside of the movie and the events inside it. You know, Confederacy of Dunces as a book is considered a comedy about nothing. So it's beta story, the actual stuff inside the book is funny, but limited in its power. Whereas the alpha story about John Kennedy Toole and how he dealt with depression and suicide is very real and powerful. It's that alpha story that gave it the power to make it win a Pulitzer Prize. And interestingly enough, it's labeled as the only comedy to win one. But I think with these, we can see that that's a bit misleading. And what probably was really going on there. Oh, and also, this makes it easy to talk about the way the brain appears to be thinking when it watches a movie or book and so on. There's alpha processing and beta processing. All the stuff from the real world, which you take into it, which you know outside and before you begin is the alpha stuff. That's the alpha story. It comes first. Then the beta story, aka what we think of as the actual movie, is a subcategory that happens within that other knowledge. The end result you get smushes them together inseparably like a mixed drink, but the alpha and beta factors both go into it. So that's what I like about those terms. Of course, you can call it whatever you want. The idea is really what's important. Really, just being able to make that step though from sensing it in some ways which i think some of us have done to actually seeing its effect and recognizing it and starting to think with it is the key so that it's not this controlling unseen force anymore that's really messing up people's lives and careers but make no mistake it's pretty clear that people do sense this like for example have you ever liked a song or a band until it got too popular well, that's because the feeling of coolness, the feeling of being original, contributes to your enjoyment of the song. You link that to what you hear. Then, once everybody else starts liking it, you lose that. And just like that, the song, the band, that same music suddenly isn't as fun for you anymore. Because your alpha emotions are screwed up. Or you have a private set of associations with the song that are replaced by other things when you see the song in so many other contexts. It's all the same thing. So you see, we can talk about these things differently now. Rather than guessing at individual causes that lead us right to counterexamples, which is that razor sort of, like Occam's razor that we talked about in the effort ratios video, uh, the effort ratios upload, we can start to see the combinations of factors that make something successful and identify all the various sources so we can know what's there and what might be missing if we're trying to make something successful. And on top of that, we can justify a lot of things that we previously only vaguely felt in other contexts. Like, for example, movie stars pay a lot of attention to their public image, making sure they're viewed positively and so on. From one perspective, you'd recognize that people may not want to support you if they think you're a jerk. But there's more to it than that. Because people associate an actor's face with everything they know about him or her emotionally, which thus bleeds over into the movie. So, while traditionally we could understand that you shouldn't kick a puppy in public if you want to be a hero in the movies, since your audience will buy fewer tickets, with this, we can now see that it's also about the other emotional associations people have with you, and the negative ones hurt the experience of watching the movie. But, if those associations match what you're supposed to be in the movie, it strengthens the experience. So, we start to understand more about why someone like Tom Cruise is so successful. Yes, he has charisma. Yes, he works with good filmmakers. Yes, he's good looking. But, if you study a bit about him, you'll know that for years he actually has cultivated the same image in real life that he has in the movies. He does rock climbing, he rides motorcycles on the beach, he's a licensed pilot, and so on. So, 
when he plays an action hero in a movie, his fans actually like the movie more because he has an air of danger or adrenaline about him from the real world. That alpha story makes the movie's story hit better. And maybe Tom Cruise did that on purpose, maybe he didn't. A lot of times people end up successful because they happen to do certain things that work, or do them in the right way without realizing it. Sometimes they have someone who tells them the right thing for whatever reason which may or may not be correct. But either way, that result is far from random. And that's why we have that Carl Jung quote in the video. If an inner situation isn't conscious, it appears like fate. Things that seem to be mystical, like why some actors got so elevated, start to become more clear as we go into these things. Now, we've said here that things like that may or may not be done purposefully. A lot of times people take advantage of these types of things without realizing it, and it's actually not as easy to realize as it may seem once we're here discussing it. I found in a lot of cases that if you can figure something out and put it clearly, and it makes sense, it will seem like we knew it all along. But there's a hindsight bias we have there, where we can check the logic of something when we hear it and verify it, which gives us the impression that we already had the connection in our heads. But when we do that, we miss out on the alternate explanations that could have been proposed for the same thing. We don't see all the possible solutions, to say it another way, that don't work that are discarded to get the one that seems obvious. In games like chess, you can figure this out. You can find out if you actually understand the moves or if they're just being presented to you by trying to guess the next move. When you do that, you're confronted with all the possibilities without them being pre-filtered. And we can see that some ideas are trickier than they seem. Well, I suppose we can't exactly do that here, but I think there are ways to demonstrate that this idea, even if we can talk about it clearly here, is actually not as widely known as it may seem. Okay, for example, we brought up Kevin Smith in the video, and how Clerks is more highly rated than pretty much every movie he's ever made since. We can say outright that the alpha story behind Clerks, the underdog story about the director maxing out his credit cards, all of that, boosted the power of Clerks. But is that, or was that, really clear? Well, let's check out the reviews. Not of Clerks, though, but of Mallrats, the movie he made after that. A lot of people were disappointed by Mallrats, but when you look through it, you'll see them guessing all kinds of reasons that they don't like it. This is essentially the same situation as guessing the next chess move. People were confronted with a scenario where a movie didn't work, but had to pick through the possibilities, and in that case, they didn't come across the idea we're talking about at all. And actually, neither did Kevin Smith when he tried to figure out why people didn't care as much about that movie. The answer he actually settled on, which the movie reviewers did too, was that Mallrats lacked the heart of Clerks. In short, it was mostly jokes and had no real human element. And generally, that was true, as far as I can tell. So, Smith took that into account when he made his next movie, Chasing Amy which had humor, but also some more believable and involved human romance. And Chasing Amy is rated higher than Mallrats, and was better received. But Chasing Amy is not as highly rated as Clerks, and it had nowhere near the impact, because the alpha story was gone. And really, there was never any adjustment made in his subsequent movies. So this shows quite clearly that they were not aware of the role that the external story was really playing in the success of the original film, even if it seems clear now that we say it. Also, it's easy to imagine, of course, how this can drive directors and producers crazy. They find a reason that is in fact valid, fix it, and still don't get the result they want. But, again, from this perspective, we can see that it is in fact insane behavior, at least by the famous definition of doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. Making good movies without any alpha story to back them and expecting them to have the power of a good movie that does have one in this case. But this phenomenon is really, really common though. Just like there's a confederacy of dunces alongside Van Gogh to echo the power of a tragedy to elevate the work, there's Rocky alongside Clerks to echo the power of an underdog story. And Sylvester Stallone was never able to recreate that success though he consistently wrote his own screenplays as he did originally, and revisited Rocky when he wanted a career boost. Again though, in the chaos, people aren't really finding the idea. Furthermore, as one more anecdote, there's El Mariachi, 
This was Robert Rodriguez's breakthrough film, which was famous for being made for $7,000, back when movies were really expensive to make. In one section of Robert Rodriguez's book about it, Rebel Without a Crew, he talks about how, before he'd brought in an agent, he showed the movie to an acquisitions guy at Miramax, but he didn't want the movie's budget to interfere with what the guy thought, so he purposefully didn't tell him about it. The guy rejected the movie, then later, after he'd picked up an agent and the movie was well known, the head of Miramax brought him in and told him that he'd wished he had seen the movie first instead of the quote, bunch of idiots working for him. But he knew the Alpha story, so his compass was corrupted. If you actually check out El Mariachi without any other knowledge, it looks like a well-made, low-budget foreign action movie, but nothing amazing. It becomes amazing once you know the budget. And in this case, we're talking about intelligent people who are judging it. The director, the acquisitions guy, and the head of Miramax, all of whom were successful and whose careers were devoted to making and recognizing good movies. And this was a situation where the alpha story, those external factors, severely warped what happened, and no one picked up on it. There was the inkling, though. Robert recognized that the knowledge of the budget was changing people's opinion, but he didn't realize that he actually needed that, and that the movie was essentially unappealing without it. He had the idea that he, quote, wanted the movie judged on its own merit, which is what we talked about in the video, how there's some sort of artistic merit which is supposed to dictate your success. And that tripped him up and made him make the movie literally less appealing. And of course, the people at Miramax were not aware of what was happening either. So again, we can see that this clear idea is in fact having huge effects and people weren't taking it into account. So let's establish then or grant that this idea is actually not popularly understood despite how powerful it can be. I imagine the next logical question is, what about film theory itself, or art theory? Even though it's not known now, has it been known or studied? Well, I set out to try to figure that out some time ago. I had some discussions with people about what I was thinking, and did a lot of researching in whatever academic papers and reference articles and so on that I could find, at least to the extent that I was able to research it. And the answer was actually no. I could not find any formal theory or known idea that reflected what we're talking about here, at least not the way we're talking about it. The closest things I got directed to in film theory were a concept from communist Russia called apparatus theory and another idea called structuralism. But apparatus theory states that movies affect people's views in the real world, which is true and it was a foundation of a lot of propaganda filmmaking, but what we're talking about here is the opposite how the world affects what we think about movies. Similarly, there's structuralism, which is a huge, sprawling concept. But in storytelling, structuralism essentially is about there being a basic framework that works well for certain stories, which is key to how good the story works regardless of other elements. So it essentially relates stories to other stories, instead of relating stories to the real world. And actually, it also predicts the opposite of what we're saying here, which is that if you follow a certain pattern, the story will always work, which has some truth to it, but can't differentiate why some stories can follow that pattern and have different amounts of success than others. What we're talking about here handles exactly that. So I didn't see anything in terms of theories about books and movies, but I was able to find some things when I started trying to find individual academic papers and studies, which is of course much harder. I found one paper that's referenced in a Malcolm Gladwell book where they did a taste test with soft drinks and changed the label on the drinks and found that people's ratings of the drinks consistently changed. But as far as I could see, they drew the wrong conclusion, that people were somehow tasting the label, when people were actually rating their emotional experience when they drank the soda, which changed based on how they felt about the label and thus is similar to this. Beyond that, I finally was able to locate something more direct in a book called you Are What You Hear by a guy named Harry Witchell, which mentions offhandedly that we have mental associations with music that can take over our normal feelings. But it doesn't seem to take it much further than that. After a few pages, he moves on to other things. So, in all honesty, I couldn't find anything. I mean, given access to all the information that's available on search engines, if that's all you can get, you pretty much have something that probably should be said. Like I said, of course, that doesn't mean that no one's ever thought about this in this way. None of us are psychic. But I can say 
that I haven't seen this really described anywhere, and especially not to the extent that I found that it matters. The question then, I think, becomes, for me too, why hasn't this been mentioned? Why isn't it out there? When the connection's in your head, it can seem obvious, but after I thought about it a bit, I realized that it might not be so easy to come across. I mean, first, you have to have that idea of art in movies being totally based on emotion, and judged by our emotional reaction. I think there's actually a lot of false leads about truth and communicating information and other things, which we talked about in the Why Do We Watch Movies video, that would stop us from even going down this path of thought in the first place. I mean, I started learning about this stuff when I was pretty young, and after 9 or 10 years, only then did some things start to hit me, including this in particular. And it was a pretty big moment, I mean, it was not obvious at first. I have this chart I worked through about the various emotions, and which ones are the most powerful. And I'd realized that, among other things, the feeling of seeing people's lives or a society change for the better is one of the most powerful emotions we can have. But. I was studying Pulp Fiction, which was probably my favorite movie, and I had this issue where I knew that this feeling of society changing or improving was so powerful and important that you really can't have the peak effect from a movie for people without it happening. You know, in Star Wars, the whole galaxy gets saved when they blow up the Death Star, that kind of thing. But I had this mini crisis, because as huge as Pulp Fiction was, this doesn't happen in Pulp Fiction. Jules learns a lesson, and that's pretty much it. So, I had a glitch in my model. I couldn't explain it. Until, eventually, it hit me that the societal change was, in fact, there in Pulp Fiction, but it was our society in the real world changing. Because Pulp Fiction, and the innovative way it was written, changed the way people thought about movies for a long time. And so, the picture was completed with something I'd never thought about in all the time I was studying this stuff. And a moment like that is pretty crazy. It opened up so much when I think about it now that it makes my heart rate go up. And for that to happen, for somebody who did take that emotion-based approach and worked on it for years, that must be something that's not only powerful but an uncommon thing for them to realize. So it had to be buried pretty deep. Okay, now, we have this idea, which appears to not have been studied or represented, but what's the real significance of it? Or, in short, how does this really make a difference in the actual daily creation of art or producing of music and movies? You know, how does the rubber hit the road here? How do we use it? That's what really matters. Well, essentially, this changes the way we approach things in any scenario where we are trying to get the best emotional effect out of our work. In other words, any time we're really working hard on something. Or, in other words, as long as we accept that we're trying to create the best emotional effect in our movie or what have you, we now think about not only the movie itself, the beta content, but the story around the movie in the real world, which is the alpha content, with the full understanding that it is half the battle, and which will matter whether we pay attention to it or not so now we can pay attention to it. Like, for example, very briefly in the video, we show an experiment that was done with a violinist named Joshua Bell. He's considered one of the best in the world, and they had him play in a train station. And, in fact, he played the same set of music he played in his concerts. And, of course, he was basically ignored. Now, the difference really comes into play if we are Joshua Bell, or we are working with him or in the business of marketing his music. We can recognize that we have a very talented musician, but a large portion of his success will depend on how the music is presented to the public, no matter how good the musician may be. If you just put him or her out there with no announcement, no further information, you're going to get nothing back. The musical talent they have provides essentially very flammable kindling, like firewood, material that can take off and have great interest, but which will require a proper alpha story or alpha factors to present it successfully. You see, a musician like Bell does very well in the concert hall environment, which is a social environment where people have various feelings of appreciation and class by being there and so on, and which is successful. But he only works in there because he is a fantastic violinist. You see, 
This is why the alpha factors are 50% and the actual talent is 50%. You can't just take any old untalented violinist and put him in Joshua Bell's seat at the concert hall. People will catch on to the fact that what they're hearing is off. And then the environment is shattered. You know, you can play a bad song with a great alpha story, but you're not going to be able to spread that song far in places where the alpha story doesn't matter. People will listen to the music if they know other people love it, which is part of it. But when they hear something bad, that's it. If it's an actual good song, then people will continue to listen and it will continue to spread. So the alpha factors gets you that attention, but in many ways the beta factors, the actual quality, are going to be needed once people have the expectation of it being good. You must be able to deliver. So we have to think in terms of both aspects being required for us to be truly successful. You need the alphas to get noticed, then the betas to stay noticed. And from there, once we have the awareness that we need both, we can then intelligently focus on how both work. And from there, you start to pick up some really good things. Like, for example, the idea that the alpha story only works for people that know the alpha story. Let's take a movie like Ocean's 12. Ocean's 12 was really poorly received. But if you watch Ocean's 12, you can see that the script had a lot of issues and got very silly. And it involved things like famous actors as characters pretending to be the famous actor they are to fool people. It essentially came off like an in-joke for the actual cast that nobody else was in on. With this, we can see what likely actually occurred here. The cast, and probably the director, read the script and loved it. Because to them, they were hanging out together and having a good time. But they confused those outside factors which they enjoyed with enjoying the actual script itself as though it were objectively good. Then, when the movie was actually released, people who weren't hanging out with them on set, who weren't the big names who were having fun with their own identity, didn't feel what they felt. Their alphas were totally different. So what made the movie seem good to the cast and the director was not present for the actual audience. So with this idea we can see that you can be misled by your alphas if you're not aware that that's what's going on. But by being aware of it and getting used to the idea, we can make more accurate decisions, especially when it comes to in-joke movies, or movies made because the alphas for the filmmakers were different than what the audience would see. Likewise, in terms of applying the idea, we've talked about how artists without these factors are going to get ignored. And this goes to many people, not just Van Gogh, but Rembrandt, unsung artists like Han Van Meegram, who was able to pass his work off as more famous painters, and writers like Edgar Allan Poe who did, by the way, understand the fundamental purpose of storytelling. Check out his essay on the poetic principle. But yet, he still struggled due to this and possibly other factors. And this goes beyond it to other people. But it's not just that you're supposed to die. That tragedy aspect is just one thing that can be an alpha story. There's also the underdog aspect, like we talked about with Kevin Smith and Clerks, and, which we touched on briefly in the video, how amazed people are with the actual creation of the work. Let's take, for example, Vermeer. Vermeer's paintings are insanely realistic. You can look them up. If that's all you go by, then he's one of the best painters who ever lived. But Vermeer had almost no reputation during his own day, even though the realism of his paintings can and could be recognized by anybody. But there's an explanation for this. You see, it's been theorized and nearly confirmed that Vermeer used a special mirror setup to create his paintings by essentially copying the image color for color, almost like a type of photography, instead of painting from memory. So if this is true, then we can see that people who knew Vermeer and how he worked were not amazed by his technique. They could see him using the mirrors to hand copy the image, almost like someone doing paint by numbers, though of course this takes much more time and effort than that. And so, that feeling of wonder, the marveling at the creation while looking at the painting, was gone. And once again, with Vermeer's lack of success, we had a result that ran contrary to our ability to explain it otherwise. If you'd like an example of this working the opposite way, there's a writer named Henry Darger. He was totally unknown and probably a bit antisocial and had obsessive tendencies. And it was discovered after he died that he'd written a 15,000 page book. Yes. 15,000, about a war involving children and fairies. I haven't read it, of course, and I don't think anybody else has either. But 
All indications are that the book isn't actually any good. But that Alpha story really is good. Not only did he die unrecognized, but he'd written a book that's one of the longest ever and is amazing in its ambition. You have a potential tragedy, and you can marvel at the creation. So a lot of people know about Henry Darger, but of course, since the book probably isn't very good, it doesn't really go further than that. But I will say that just like a fantastic level of actual internal quality is like kindling that can explode with a bit of external story, this likely is the other way. It's a fantastic level of external story that would explode if the book was any good at all. Anyway, let's emphasize that just like some people have been held down by a lack of a good alpha story without realizing it, we can also see the opposite in history. There are plenty of people who've been built up by their alpha story without realizing it. Mozart was a child prodigy, then lost that and lost his popular interest even as his musical talent went up. Now he's the greatest musician. Beethoven, on the other hand, is generally considered the second greatest, which is nowhere near as powerful as being the greatest. But Beethoven has something entirely different going for him. He has the incredible irony of being a brilliant composer who went deaf. Speaking of tragedy, dramatic irony, and all those things, that's right there. That's the external factor that lifts Beethoven's work. And with that in mind, it might start to become clear why Stephen Hawking is so famous. By the same token, we have Picasso. Picasso is essentially the counterexample to the idea that all artists die poor, and that the public can't appreciate art and so on. But check out that quote by him that we used in the video. For some odd reason, you're not going to find that quote on his wiki quote page, at least not when I looked, but it's in his book and it explains pretty much everything about Picasso's success, especially once we view it through this lens. He says essentially that he became aware that men didn't want artistic merit as he was taught, but instead liked riddles and games and so on, and he played into it on purpose, and that it made him very wealthy. So essentially, Picasso, who did have a lot of talent, check out his early sketches, purposefully created these factors for himself, and it elevated his work and played a huge part in him becoming really wealthy. But even still, when you look further at what he said, he adds that it's a painful admission, and that as a result of this, he never considered himself a real artist. So despite doing this, Picasso never really saw it as being part of people's consumption of art. In his mind, he was still following the model he'd apparently been taught about the importance of pure artistic merit and how that should be what makes you succeed. So he used these things, but didn't really grasp what was going on. And so that puts us in our unique position now. We have a clear image of the idea, and we can use it on purpose. And of course, we have to use it, or have it manipulate us without our knowledge. It's not optional. And furthermore, people should start to use this and be aware of it because I don't think anyone should have great talent or passion for their art form and be stuck in that situation where they're powerless to succeed or be recognized. Anyway, removing this unseen factor, seeing it for all of us, evens out the playing field in that regard. It makes it more about the talent aspect and not who randomly has the alpha aspect. And that's good. So of course, as part of working my way through it, I came up with a general list of the major types of alpha factors. I have it on a chart, which I can't show you here, but I'll list them really quickly in order of importance. Basically, first, do you like the creator as a person? Then is their work mysterious or intriguing, like Prince in the 80s? Is the work teaching new ways of doing the work or creating social change, like Pulp Fiction or anything innovative? Does the story's creation, after that, confirm our beliefs, like underdog stories like Clerks or Rocky? Then does it make us feel better as a person, more social and so on? Then there's minor things like are you romantically attracted to the creator or can you laugh at the creator's failed attempt, which is camp movies like The Room. Or finally, can you just appreciate that the creator tried, like if your child made a movie. That's obviously a lot to take in, especially without the chart. For now, let's just touch on the general concept of how to use this, which is that beyond the artwork or music or story itself, the story of the story is what you want to be aware of. It's about the creator how people react to them as a person, and what the work itself means or represents in the world. 
That's what's mixing together. Back to Picasso. His most famous painting, Guernica, isn't that great to see artistically, at least if you ask me. But it's famous because people associate it with a particular event in history, a specific bombing in the Spanish Civil War. It's seen as a cultural symbol. That's very emotionally powerful. And that's the type of thing to start to be aware of. If you're a writer or musician or painter yourself, be aware that people are going to react to you based on those things. And if you don't have it, it literally will weaken the impact that your actual work will have. So in general, if you do have those things, whatever they are, they'll strengthen the work. But since this is outside your actual work, it's something to think about separately. If you want to have the best impact, you still need to do great actual work in addition to this. Likewise, if you're producing or uh, an agent or someone who represents art, we can start to become aware of the source of our reactions. Is it in the actual work itself, or is it in the events surrounding it? And if it's the events surrounding it, will the audience be aware of those events as well? If yes, it'll work fine. But if no, you could not get what you're expecting. By the same token, the audience can often react to events that you're not aware of and elevate some things you don't see. And we can start to look out for that. Okay, so this went a lot longer than I expected, but that's okay, I think, because this is a major topic to me. And we're going to expand on all this stuff more, but we're going to do it in the specific circumstances as it comes up in videos and discussions about various movies and books and things in the future so we'll be able to see the different ways it functions. I hope that I was able to get across one-third or some fraction of how fascinating and significant this concept is to me and to the way I look at things. If so, then hopefully you've enjoyed listening to this, and I hope you stay tuned to the channel because we are scratching the surface and we are going to continue further as long as you're along for the ride. That's it, and it's time to rest my voice for a bit. Thanks.